Coming up on DTNS, Apple makes nice with indie repair shops, robots for fixing your brain, and the play date with Nicole Lee. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, August 29th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. As I just mentioned, Ms. Nicole Lee, senior editor at Engadget, is back on the show. Welcome back, Nicole. Happy to be back. Thank you so much. We I can't wait to talk about the the little weird console game with a black and white screen that seems awesome that you got a chance to <laughs> play with. Yeah, absolutely. That's the play date. That's the name of the console. We're gonna get it's a handheld <laughs> console. Yes. We're gonna talk about that in a bit. Uh, if you are a patron and you subscribe to the Good Day Internet feed, you know that we spent most of it talking about seafood and fried chicken. If that sounds interesting to you, you can <laughs> sign up and listen as well at patreon.com slash DTNS. All right, let's start with a few tech things you should know. Apple sent out invitations to an event on September 10th at 10 a.m. at the Steve Jobs Theater in Cupertino, California. The invite showed a five-colored version of its logo with the text, by innovation only. Oh, I wonder if it'll be phones. <laughs> well, it'll be innov innovative, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. I did not get innovated to this event, but... Neither did I. Uh, Microsoft Executive Vice President Harry Shum told the World Artificial Intelligence Conference in Shanghai that the HoloLens 2 will go on sale in September. Microsoft announced it at Mobile World Congress. They've been taking pre-orders for $3,500 a pop. Uh, the HoloLens 2 has a larger field of view and improved eye and hand tracking. All right, let's talk a little bit more about what's going on with Huawei. A source tells Reuters that Huawei plans to launch its Mate 30 lines of phones on September 18th in Munich, Germany. Google told Reuters that under current U.S. trade rules, the Mate 30 will not be able to include Google apps and services such as the Google Play Store. The U.S. Department of Commerce has received more than 130 applications from companies to ease such restrictions against supply and highway, highway, Huawei rather. <laughs> highway. Yeah, really. Uh, that's a good show title. But none have been approved as of yet of those 130. Google hasn't commented on whether or not it has applied. Huawei can use the open source version of Android, which doesn't include Google's services. Meanwhile, the Wall Street Journal reports that it has sources saying U.S. prosecutors are investigating Huawei for allegations of intellectual property theft from individuals and companies. So as far as the tech world goes, uh, we know this is part of a much larger story, but uh, as far as the tech world goes, this is the the the, the call in your bluff moment. Uh, Google Google hasn't confirmed whether they've applied, but we can assume they have. They, they've, they've said they would like to continue to supply Huawei uh, with the official version of Android with Google services on it. Huawei has said they would like that as well. Uh, and Huawei not backing down, saying, all right, we're going to put out our phone September 18th one way or the other. Uh, and that gives us 20 days to see if any of these applications get approved, if one of those applications is Google's, if that's enough time for Huawei to be able to, you know, get get the uh, get the Android operating system in the pipeline. Uh, because I, I think everyone agrees that if the Mate 30 launches without Google services on it, it's not going to do as well as if it launched with Google services on it. Yeah, I suppose the open source version of Android is a possibility, but you know, this is such a short amount of time. You can't, it, to, to have all these phones in the pipeline that, I, I suppose you could announce a phone and, and shipping could be delayed based on how this all shakes out. Well, but, you can do a software update. If, if, the, if yeah, this were the problem true. with the processor or something, you, you're absolutely right. But you could you can have something that checks when you during startup and says, hold on, we can we can actually add this now. Well, okay, I suppose. And if that what if if Huawei magically had its own OS in place, which is that's that is probably a slim mm -hmm. chance. Would it be the sort of thing that anybody would choose over Android? Uh, I think that, sorry. Yeah, um, no, go ahead, Nicole. I was going to say, I don't know what, it, like, you know, this whole thing with uh, the trade situation with Huawei and the US, I mean, that's obviously part of this larger issue, as you said, Tom. Um, Huawei does have, does have its own OS. Um, it's not Android, but it's kind of is. It's sort of based on this open source version of it. And um, I don't, they might have to go their own. I, you know, it really, I don't know what the deal is. I mean, it sounds as if Google wants to and who always wants to, but it's all down to this really iffy and contentious relationship right now between the two countries. Um, I don't, it might not be a choice. I guess is what I'm trying to say. It's like, it might yeah. not be a choice. 
It, it, it all depends on how trade negotiations with China are going and the brinksmanship uh, that is being used for those negotiations. Now, now mo most recently, uh, as of this recording, China had backed off their retaliatory tariffs for the moment, uh, which means that you know the 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 negotiations have cooled down a bit for the moment but if you've been following those negotiations you know that nothing stays the same for long so by september 18th it's quite likely that huawei doesn't have approval to use google services my guess is that their huawei uh the honor os is really meant for internet of things it's not meant for phones i'm guessing it's not ready for phones huawei has not made any indication that it is ready for phones which means they will just run you know plain wrapper open source android without the Google services, which is something that uh, they run in China. The the Chinese version of Huawei is that. Uh, so they have experience with offering that. It's just that they can get updates from Google faster, even in China, if they're allowed to get yeah. those updates. That's really the big sticking point is Google can't provide them security updates through the Google version of Android under this law, which means that their security updates have to come later because they have to wait for them to get pushed out to the wider operating system that is open source. Yeah, apparently it's called Harmony OS. Oh, Harmony, is, I say uh, Yeah, that's the OS. OS. Yeah, yeah, Harmony, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah I don't think they're gonna use, I, I don't see them using that on a phone for a couple of years. And by then yeah. I think this whole story has changed. All right, Apple announced the Independent Repair Provider Program, which will let repair shops in the US get authorized parts and tools, training, diagnostics, and other resources without having to pay to become an Apple authorized service provider. You can apply for this independent repair provider program for free. Uh, you do have to meet some criteria. Um, most of the criteria revolve around having Apple certified technicians, but certification through Apple is also free, uh, except for your time. Uh, so this is something that a lot of people have been criticizing Apple about because, you know, we talked about the Amazon story where they said, well, if it's not a an Apple authorized reseller, you can't sell it on Amazon, which put a lot of smaller businesses out of uh, place. This is the equivalent for repair where Apple had been cracking down and saying you have to be an authorized repair uh provider. And now they're loosening that up and saying, okay, we, we want people to have a good experience uh, having their Apple stuff fixed, but we don't want to limit as much how they have it fixed. And and Sarah, I know this applies <laughs> to you today. Very close to home. Yeah. I have a uh, MacBook Pro. It's a couple of years old, but it's in decent shape, but the display is shot. It needs a new display and it's kind of a known issue. Sadly, not under warranty, but the nearest uh, um, authorized uh, repair shop is closer than the nearest Apple store. So that's where I went. But it still was a hassle. It was a hassle to get to. It was kind of a hassle to go through um, the, the rigmarole of, of letting them know what was wrong with my computer and dropping it off. It's there now. Hopefully everything turns out well. There are repair shops, though, that are closer to me. They're just not authorized. And it's mm -hmm. one of those deals where they're not going to be able to help me because they have to have a good relationship with Apple. So this, again, yeah, you, you want the people to know what they're doing. Long as they do, I say, open it up. I don't know that this satisfies the the most excitable people in the right to repair movement uh, because this is an Apple just providing tools to anybody. Uh, but Nicole, it, it feels like Apple is at least trying to move in the direction of doing the right thing, right? Yeah, I mean, Apple's never going to be completely open and we just have to accept that. That's just how the companies run. Uh, but, you know, this is at least a good thing, um, especially for those independent retailers, which, you know, to be, which I don't actually... I would be interested to see the numbers of how many retailers there are now compared to like a few years ago and whether that number have gone has gone down because they're, they don't have this official relationship with Apple or whatever. Um, so it would be interesting to see if there's maybe a resurgence or maybe there's maybe an uptick of this relationship and whether that will be improvement in this independent businesses or not. Um, hopefully it does. Hopefully it comes up with, again, like, you know, Sarah, like not everyone is close to an Apple store, right? Like that's just the reality of it. And hopefully this means that more people can get their stuff fixed. Yeah. And 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 I like that Apple's like, yeah, we want you to get certified. We'll provide that for free. But that means that even if you're not going to an authorized service provider, you're hopefully still going to get a, a good experience. 
Well, speaking of fi fixing things, Google will now pay researchers who find verifiably and unambiguous evidence of data abuse using its platforms. Google will pay a bug bounty if somebody identifies, quote, situations where user data is being used or sold unexpectedly or repurposed in an illegitimate way without user consent. Also, the app or Chrome extension will be removed or API access removed, depending on uh, the nature of the abuse. There's no reward table, but a single report could get $50,000 in bounties, apparently. Instagram recently added misuse of data to its bug bounty program as well. Yeah, this is great news. I think uh, Google is... Uh, doing something good and, and and not that they're the first, obviously, like you said, Instagram's doing it too, to say, hey, uh, vulnerabilities aren't just about uh, breaking in and, and doing malware and, and malicious things, but it's about how your data is used. You, if you give data to somebody and they use it in a way that you didn't know or didn't approve, uh, that is a bug. That is a, that is a, that is a malicious behavior of its own, even if it's not malware. Uh, so let's try to get more eyes on that. Uh, this is, this is an excellent move, right? I think so. I think, you know, anything that is going to help the ecosystem of any company that offers bug bounty programs, what do you have to lose? Somebody comes to you with information, you, you, you fix issues and you say, thank you. <laughs> We'd like to pay you for your good deed. Uh, I know that bug bounty programs have, have expanded for a lot of companies over the last year, really. And that's, that's a great thing for folks that can help you make the products that you, you sell them stronger. Yeah, and I really love it that the bug bounty has expanded to not just include you know, actual real like bugs, but also, as you mentioned, the the fact that the data can be abused by third parties for like you know nefarious purposes and so forth. Yeah, maybe we, uh, Google can have a bug bounty program for when YouTube recommends something that's stupid or unauthorized <laughs> to me. Right. Uh, which <laughs> happens quite frequently. And then yeah. I have to get paid for no A bug bounty that, program hey, for saying, you know what I would really, have done differently? Yeah, that wasn't really the Star Wars trailer that your YouTube notification told me uh, I could watch. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, but no, I, I say that sarcastically because that's a thing that happens with YouTube and it's one of the problems with YouTube. But it, it, I, I also say it because this is Google saying, hey, let's take an existing tool that's used for a specific thing and use it to help fix this other thing because it can it's a tool that can be used for that too. So I think mm -hmm. that's good. Uh, engineers at MIT have published a paper in the journal Science Robotics describing a robotic thread they developed that can wind its way through brain blood vessels to deliver clot reducing drugs. Uh, to treat strokes or aneurysms. Possibly they could uh, equip it with lasers uh, to take out clots. It's a nickel titanium thread with a rubbery paste embedded with magnetic particles and covered with a hydrogel. <laughs> so why all that? The hydrogel helps prevent the thread from damaging blood vessels and makes it possible to enter blood vessels in the brain that were previously too risky. So there are parts of the brain where right now they they do take a thread when they go in and, and get rid of clots, but sometimes they get to a point where like, yeah, we'll do more harm than good if we go there. This hydrogel helps them to reach those spots uh, and also prevents damaging blood vessels in any other place. The magnetic particles that are in there let the thread be moved by magnets, uh, and this would let surgeons perform from outside the operating room. Now that's something that's important because the fluoroscopes that are used to let surgeons see in such procedures expose the surgeons to radiation. So they're they're physically tasking. Uh, they, they're, they're not good for the surgeons to do that too often. So this could help. Also, you can use a joystick <laughs> to do brain surgery. Uh, that is a real thing that is in the paper. The robotic thread is not yet ready for clinical use. They have demonstrated how it works on a life-size replica of the brain's major blood vessels, however. So they've showed that their control system works. The next steps would be to do it in an actual living tissue. Wow. Magnets, how do they work? Yeah, <laughs> really. They work on your brain. That's how yeah. That's amazing. That's really like the fact that you can, that you mentioned you, you, the fact that you can use it outside of the body, outside, outside of the room. That's like next, that's like sci-fi stuff right there. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, I mean, anybody I mean, there's who, some remote operations that are already happening, but not right, on this right. level. Right. Not at this precision, right? I right. Mean, yeah. This, this is, you're right. There, there's lots of remote operations that are possible. And this is a, a new one to add to the stack, right? Which is pretty cool. 
Well, and the fact that not only is it the precision is really important when you're talking about brain surgery and blood vessels, but also the fact that the surgeons themselves are physically in much better shape than being uh, exposed to something that's going to harm them while they're saving other people's lives. Yeah, and and not to mention that this would, uh, if it if it turns out that it that it works well in living tissue, which there's no reason to think it wouldn't, but they haven't done it yet, uh, this would allow them to get to clots that they wouldn't otherwise. So it it will literally save lives that that you can't save right now. Um, so yeah, I mean, doesn't involve Google, Facebook. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> part of humanity. It's not a security breach. Like uh, Roger and I got very excited uh, when we saw this uh, today. Um, so yeah, hoping, uh, hoping to bring you more stories like these, uh, as time goes on, because, uh, this is, this is pretty positive and real. Like it's, it's a real thing that they've done, right? It's not like, Hey, maybe we could do this. Some, sometimes those are interesting scientific papers too, where they have a theory, but this is something that, that does work. They just need to now make it work on humans in a safe way. I, I can't help but think of a doctor navigating my brain with a joystick as if I was a Pac-Man game, you know, like, <laughs> you know, we got to get over to that little aneurysm here over in the top left quickly, yeah. quickly. Um, and I'm also, sure I think, it's a little bit more involved than that. I think the key here is if they can do this kind of procedure quickly, that I think is the next step because um, mm -hmm. strokes are very time sensitive. You need to get at that clock like ASAP. So if they can do all of this stuff on the quick, that would be a next step level for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good news for Plex users, potentially. Plex announced that later this year we'll add an on-demand library of movies and TV series from Warner Brothers available to U.S. Plex users for free, although they will be ad-supported. The content will be available whether you pay for Plex Premium or not. Plex plans to add content from other partners as well. This I was actually pretty trend. excited. Pretty yeah. excited about this. So I use I use Plex as my main media server. Um, it, it, like many media management programs, it's all about the content that you have. I mean, it doesn't do anything for you unless you have content to watch. But let's say you don't run a media server or you don't have access to a friend's media server. This is the sort of thing that Plex as a, I mean, as user experience and interface, I love it. it heads and shoulders above the competition, at least for me. So this would give somebody who's like, well, okay, at least I can watch a certain library of stuff from within Plex. And the fact that you don't have to pay for it, Plex Premium is, it gives you some extras, you know, syncing options and kind of live TV recording and that sort of thing. But I, I don't pay for that either. So the the free option is is pretty great. But yeah, like I think you were about to say, Tom, this is this is definitely a trend. Yeah, this is a trend uh, to add these free streaming uh, options. Uh, IMDb TV uh, does it. Vudu does it. If you you can buy things from Vudu, but you can also just watch things. Roku has a channel with these free streaming options. So something to keep an eye on, especially if those of you who complain about you know, oh my gosh, there's too many bills, there's too many channels to pay for. Uh, you're seeing more and more of these free options now. They are ad supported, but this is sort of the equivalent of your cable television channels that show movies, right? Uh, with actually fewer advertisements. Some of them are better than others. Some of them will just do pre-roll and then you watch the movie. Sometimes others of them will interrupt your movie with an ad in a weird place. Uh, so they're, they're still sort of working out that system. But I ex expect to see more of this. And I think, like you said, Sarah, it's really interesting to see Plex get into this game. Yeah. Nicole, I don't know how much experience, if any, you have with Plex, but uh, but it, it, this, is, this, is a, it's, this is a welcome addition. Yeah, you know, I haven't used, I, I don't really use Plex, but this is great. And hopefully this kind of model will spread to other, you know, services as well. And I think you, as, you know, as more, more and more, more and more people cut the core, this will be even more important going forward. Well, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. On Wednesday, Nicole posted her write-up of the $149 handheld game system Playdate. It's made by Panic Inc., the folks behind software like Transmit and the publisher of games like Firewatch, if you know those. It was announced May 22nd, and 110,000 people so far have signed up for the wait list, while 8,000 developers have registered to make content for the device. Uh, Nicole, tell us about this weird yet compelling little handheld gaming machine. Yeah, so when it first when it was first announced in May 22nd, um, I, along with I'm sure much of the internet, at, I, or so it seemed anyway, uh, was very excited about this small little thing. And it's like it's it's a small little handheld thing, 
basically the size of a post-it note stack. Uh, but, but the thing that made everyone sort of like gasp, I guess, is that it has a crank. Yes, I said a crank. <laughs> There's actually not, not to power it though. You're not like no. Yeah. Well, I I, I I talked to them and they said no. That it's far too small for you to be able to crank it. And even then, it would take a lot of cranks to power mm -hmm. it up. So that's not a really a realistic thing for you. The crank is actually a game controller. So yeah, <laughs> it's it's actually a you, know, you, you don't have to use. The, the crank for some, but some games do require the crank as its main uh, controller. So there's a D-pad, a couple of buttons, and this crazy crank thing. And that's like a super unique part of this game, part, part of this handheld, sorry. It's a black and white screen. So it has, that's kind of like weird retro appeal, but it's a very modern system because it has, you know, an ARM compatible processor. It has Wi-Fi, it has Bluetooth on here, USB-C charging. Um, so it's a very modern system, but with like weird retro vibes because of this black and white screen. Also the black and white screen, it's a sharp memory LCD, not a, you know, like a Kindle e-ink screen. Um, it's a short memory LCD. Think like early Pebble watches. Think like the screen on your coffee maker. Like it's that kind of like weird screen. I don't know how to describe well, it. You, but, you um, mentioned uh, that they said that the screen is used in very few other places. One of them being the coffee machines at 7-Elevens in Japan, right? Yeah. So it's very limited. And and because it's so limited, it's only made by Sharp. Sharp is the only company that makes this memory LCD. And because of that, it's not mass produced. And because it's not mass produced, it's kind of surprisingly expensive, according to uh, the panic people. So like, it would actually be cheaper for them to go with an OLED full color screen because that's like mass produced on a, on a large so, scale. But why, why, why don't they do that then? Like, the, are they just being hip? <laughs> Well, that's kind of part of it, but they, they want it to be kind of outside of the box, right? They want it to be like sort of kooky, but cool, but not really cool and sort of modern yet retro, but not really retro. It's that sort of in-between thing. And part of it is that they want to capture the feel of those old school like Game & Watch style games. I don't know if you guys remember mm -hmm. the Nintendo yeah. Game & Watch style games, but not quite that level because it's not that you know, it's not that technology. But the interesting thing about this is also because of the black and white screen, it's it has it has that retro stick, sh right? It has it sort of strikes that nostalgia uh, memory, I guess, if you want to think of it that way. But the other part of it is that it's actually a really good screen. It's mm. like it's a really pixel dense screen, like a really good black and white screen. Um, that's kind of why they went with it. And the other part, the reason, other reason why they didn't go with the whole, uh, all that full color screen is because your phone is full color. You know, like every other thing in your life, your tablet is a full color, your laptop is a full color screen. So there's nothing unusual about it if they went with that all that full color screen. So according to them, this is their reasoning is that we didn't uh -huh. want it to be just like your phone because you have your phone. Your phone exists. Yeah. So what, what is something, something different, something that, that your phone can't offer you? Right, give you a different gaming experience. It's it's not just about looking different. It's about giving you a different experience that you wouldn't get otherwise. Right, exactly. And right. the other, the other the other key part to the play date and why it's called the play date is because with the hundred and forty nine dollars, you, you don't get just the the console. You also get a season's worth of games. And the idea is that is that. Every week on like let's say a Monday for like twelve weeks, you get a new game delivered to you, and it's a surprise. I mean, well, not all, to be fair, like a couple of games have been spoiled, have been spoiled already. But the 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 at least the idea is that every every week you would get a game delivered to your you know play date box or whatever as a surprise, and it's called a play date because that's the date that you get your game, um, and that's the other like unique part of the whole concept. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's easy to dismiss this as, as you know, hipstery uh, silliness <laughs> that you don't need. Uh, and you're not wrong. It, it, is, right. it is definitely hipstery and you don't need it. But right. if you want it and, you, and you're like, yeah, but I, I like the idea of having a dedicated gaming device that I can hold in my hand. There's some interesting things about this, including like the crank control, which is, I know it's great for fishing games. It's, I'd be interested to see what else it can be good for. Right. Uh, and, and that experience of like, hey, these are games tailored for this device. So you're going to get an experience gaming that you can't get otherwise because it, because other devices don't do this. They don't have this kind of black and white screen. They don't have this control system, et cetera. 
And that's something to think about too, because these most of the designers that have signed up for this device are indie game developers. Like the mm. one that has uh, been blowing up is that one that they've been publicizing is um, Crankin's Time Travel Adventures by Kira Takahashi, who is the person behind Karamari Damasi, if you know mm -hmm. that game, the rolling ball. Uh, so the <laughs> Very wag. He makes very kind of wacky, out of the box kind of games. So the Kraken's time travel adventure. You use the crank to control the the flow of time. So if you go forward, the the, the character goes forward, and if you roll backwards or you spin it backwards, the character moves backwards. Huh. So that's kind of the concept behind this little game. But even though you can control the flow of time of this character, the enemies and obstacles around it exist outside of the time flow. So oh, it's a wow. weird way to let the character to interact with its environment depending mm -hmm. on your place in time. So it's, yeah, it's very well, interesting. Well, like any game yeah. console, the games developed for it are going to make or break it, right? That sounds like a yeah. really interesting one. Uh, real yeah. quickly, Fopa in our chat room on Twitch has a uh, question. Are there online games? Because Playdate makes it sound like you could play with others. Um. So they haven't they haven't really talked about all of these games just yet, but they've okay. talked about that the, they, 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 there is Wi-Fi involved, and um, and even though you can get games delivered every week, you will you will because it's an open source system, you will be you will be allowed to sideload games. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't know about the Wi-Fi online player option. I'm not I'm not sure is what I'm trying to say. Hmm. I don't know. Just hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks, Nicole, for, for sharing the uh, experience there. It sounds interesting. Yeah. And also thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit, submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. If you hang out on Facebook, head on over to our group, facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. I'd say check the mailbag, but today we're checking the Discord. We are. It's a different kind of mailbag, really. It's a, it's a live mailbag of sorts. <laughs> and if you're not in our Discord, you're missing some good conversations. For instance, earlier this month, Jay Ramadan had posted, for all the places I seem to go now where Apple Pay is accepted, it seems somewhat appropriate to get the Apple card for 2% back, possibly 3% if the Uber deal with the other merchants ever happens. Easy to get. We'll kick the we'll, we'll kick tires on it. Gadget Virtuoso also chimed in on the thread and said, I didn't really need another credit card either, but the perks are decent enough. It's impressive to apply, be approved, and then be able to use the card for lunch very same day. That into itself is going to change things for banks if they're not paying attention. BioCow added a little expertise as well and said, some banks can already do that. Actually, they have a card put into your Apple or Google wallet, but it will be become more common moving forward. This is a nice feature even for debit cards. If you lose your card, call and get a new one. While you wait three to five days for it to arrive in the mail, you can use it from your phone. The best audience in the world making you smarter all the time. And you can join our Discord. Lots of great conversations happening there every day by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash DTNS. Yeah, good stuff in there. You know, when you were talking about the Apple card uh, while I was out, uh, I tried to go in and look and see how to sign up for it. I couldn't because I was not in the United States. Oh, that's funny. I, I, I did not. I'm not getting a physical card because I'm just, you know, I'm going to scratch that thing up to heck or high heaven for sure. Um, but I, I am now an Apple card hmm. um, member mm -hmm. yeah. and it was very painless setup experience. Thanks, everybody who writes us emails, hangs out in Discord, Slack channel, subreddit, all of those things. And extra special thanks to Nicole Lee for being with us today. Nicole, tell folks how to keep up with all of your fabulous work. Um, you can always go to Engadget.com for my latest writing, or you can just go check out my Twitter, doc, my Twitter page, which is Twitter.com slash Nicole. Our show is funded by you, unless you're not funding it, in which case it's not funded by you. But it is... 90% funded by actual people making small bits of support uh, through patreon.com slash DTNS. Get a few people supporting us on PayPal, which they, they don't even get anything for except the satisfaction of knowing they're supporting us. The point being, uh, we don't have a big corporation behind us. We are the corporation, me, Roger, and Sarah. That's, that's all you got. So if you like our perspective and you want to support independent tech news, uh, think about becoming a member. We've got some rewards for you at patreon.com slash DTNS. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. And we are live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. And you can find out more and tell a friend. Dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Richard Gunther and Lynn Peralta. Talk to you then. Yeah. 
This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>